Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us for our cardiology grand rounds this week. Uh, we have the honor of hearing from our very own Dr. Rita Redberg on the topic of FDA device regulation. Uh, Dr. Redberg is a professor of medicine in the division of cardiology at UCSF. Um, she received her medical doctorate degree from University of Pennsylvania and completed both her internal medicine and her cardiology training at Columbia Presbyterian. She came to UCSF and joined faculty in 1990, and she has been the chief, of editor, uh, chief editor of JAMA Internal Medicine since 2009, during which time the impact factor of the journal has more than doubled. She has had a long-standing commitment to women and heart disease as a member of the Women's Heart Alliance, co-founding the UCSF Center of Excellence in Women's Health and receiving the Honorable Women's Day Red Dress Award in 2011, as well as the Bay Area American Heart Association Red Dress Award in 2010. Dr. Redberg has served on many roles focused on medical insurance and clinical quality improvement, including the Medicare Payment Advisory uh, Commission Medicare Evidence Development and uh, Coverage Advisory Committee. She's also on the Fed, uh, Food and Drug Administration uh, Cardiovascular Devices Expert Panel and the American College of Cardiology's Clinical Quality Committee, to name a few. Her research interests are in our use of medical procedures and devices by studying the regulatory process for medical devices and the strength of evidence that supports them. Thank you, Dr. Redberg, for joining us. Again, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A uh, box and we'll get started. Thanks so much, Joyce. It's really a pleasure to be here and um, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about FDA device regulation. So how to balance innovation uh, with evidence, which has been a passion of mine um, for quite a number of years now, and a topic I will note that I think I didn't know a lot about um, before I started studying it, actually with um, Sanket Druva when he was a medical student and now on our faculty about 15 years ago. And I still think it's probably not covered very much in undergraduate, undergraduate medical or um, graduate medical education. So glad to be able to share some of what we've learned with you. Um, next slide is uh, my disclosures. I have research funding and you no know, financial conflicts. Next slide. Just a little bit about me. Um, I did grow up in Brooklyn and uh, be way before it was hip and really never imagined I would end up spending most of my life in California because I was definitely one of those New Yorkers where there was the Hudson River and then the rest of the country. But here I am. Um, I got interested in this uh, topic largely when I started medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. And when I say this topic, I mean kind of technology assessment and how we spend so much money in healthcare and um, get, I think, not very good return on our investment. Um, I worked with John Eisenberg when I was a medical student. He was the chief of general internal medicine, and he went on to be the first director of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. But at the time, he was doing a study to try to reduce um, inpatient lab test ordering by the house staff by sending them notes, um, because it was before email, every morning and asking about these um, tests, the electrolytes and CBCs that were ordered daily on most inpatients, and how did the results lead to changes in outcome or changes in management, and you know, were the patients having better outcomes? And these notes had little impact on house staff test ordering, but it had a big impact on me as a, a second year medical student, and I really started thinking about things that I hadn't questioned before, like just because we can get information should we get that information? And is this test or treatment actually going to lead to improved health outcomes for our patients? And so I ended up um, getting a fellowship from University of Pennsylvania and taking a year between my third and fourth year in medical school and getting a health policy degree at the London School of Economics, which was very interesting, not just for the experience of living in London for a year, but I also got a National Health Service card. I did some classes um, 
in the British medical school system and studied uh, health policy. And then more recently, but still not that recent, I spent a year in Washington, D.C. as a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow. And if anyone is interested in any of those, I'm happy to talk more about it offline. So going on to medical devices, next slide. Um, I got interested in medical devices because as we all know, because cardiology is one of the biggest areas for medical device use, we use a lot of medical devices and a lot of them um, are wonderful and life-saving or certainly helpful for our patients. But it's also a big area if you look at why do we spend so much money on healthcare in the US, um, way more than in the next um, highest spending country in the developed world. And a lot of it is on technology and medical devices. The industry in the United States is estimated at over $133 billion. And I suspect that's an underestimate. Um, and so I'm gonna talk today about how do we evaluate devices before they get um, on the market and used in our clinical care, particularly in cardiology. And that leads me to the FDA, because as we know, the FDA is the agency that does the evaluation before approval. And so I will note, of course, devices are different than drugs. And so there are different pathways for devices, but they're very different in a number of ways. Some of them, I think, justified and some not. Um, certainly for devices, um, we frequently want to make small changes and improvements in design. And so some of the pathways account for that. Devices often are implanted. And that has, I think, big implications because if something is implanted, it means that if you discover after it's been implanted that it's dangerous and there's a recall, and I will talk a little later about some of those recalls, as I think our interventionalists and um, electrophysiologists in particular know, it becomes a very difficult decision on whether to then remove that device. It's not like a drug where if a drug is recalled, you can just stop prescribing and stop using. A device, once it's implanted, would have to then be removed and that can be risky. Um, and so the pathway is different than for drugs where the standard is two randomized clinical trials. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Next slide. Um, this slide is probably tiny and it mostly is just to illustrate, um, this is actually from the cardiovascular device uh, division publication from Bram Zuckerman who heads that division on regulatory review. But I'll just tell you that it illustrates the many different pathways that devices can get to market and we can go to the next slide and I will um, go in a little more detail in that pathway. So for different pathways, um, for, pre, uh, for high risk devices, the pathway that Congress intended to be used when it established the device division at FDA was the pre-market approval pathway. And an original pre-market approval or PMA as it's known is what is intended to be used if you're a high-risk device, which is certainly a lot of cardiology devices. As I mentioned a moment ago, a lot of times a manufacturer or a sponsor, as they're known, wants to make a small change in the way a device is manufactured. And I'm sure you're all familiar, you know, to change the material, say for the lead or the way the, or the tavers, the way the valve is made. And if it's considered to be not a big change, and that decision is actually made by the manufacturer, instead of going through the original pre-market process again, they can just file um, essentially paperwork, which is a supplemental PMA, which does not require um, necessarily any clinical data. And so those are the ways that high-risk devices are intended to get on the market. There are some other ways that I'll spend a little time talking about, such as the humanitarian device exemption. And then there's also 510K clearance, which unlike the pre-market approval, doesn't require any clinical data. And what you have to show in this pathway is substantial equivalence. And that means that 
it has to be substantially equivalent to a device already on the market, which is also called a predicate device. And then for low risk devices, um, general controls, which is essentially filing um, paperwork. So with the next slide, I'll talk um, about FDA medical device classes. And as I said, I'm gonna spend a little time on class three because that is what most cardiovascular devices will fall into, or we think so. Although I should note that less than 1% of all devices actually go through pre-market approval. So this is not that uh, common a pathway. It is um, intended for devices that support or sustain human life. And the criteria for approval in this pathway is safety and effectiveness. Next slide. So in the PMA pathway, the FDA publishes the summary of safety and effectiveness data. And this data is essentially the data that the FDA used on which to make their approval decision to either approve or not approve the device. And the FDA says that the SSED is intended to present a reasons, objective, and balanced critique of the scientific evidence which served as the basis of the decision to approve or deny the PMA. And I go through that because I want to tell you about the first sort of study that um, Sanket Druva and I did when he was a trainee that really looked at, um, next slide, pre-market approvals. And so for this study, we looked at the strength of study evidence um, that the FDA examined before approving high-risk cardio devices, high-risk cardiovascular devices. So we looked at 123 studies of 78 devices, of which only 27%, um, it turns out, were randomized and 14% were blinded. And I will say that going into this study, I think we fully expected to see high quality um, randomized control trials for almost all cardiovascular devices. You know, I didn't really know a lot about the pre-market approval process before this study. That had just been my assumption. I thought it would be like the drug approval process, which is, I think, better known and I was more familiar with. But that's not what we found, as I said. And in fact, in, as opposed to the drug process where two RCTs are standard, um, RCTs were rare and most of the pre-market approvals, 65%, were based on a single study. And Joyce, we're still on my slides and your slide to the right. Okay. Is this the correct slide? Not looking at your screen, that's why I'm asking. Um, let me go. Uh, is that the one you were just on? No, I was just on this one. Okay, perfect. You're perfect. Yeah, you can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's go back to that. So these are, again, just to summarize the findings from our study. This was the table. And as you can see, again, the randomized studies um, were 31% of the total. Um, whether they had blinded studies was even rarer at 13%. And a lot of studies use something um, called retrospective controls, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Next slide. Um, so, and we also found that 88% of the endpoints in these studies that were used to um, base FDA approval of high-risk cardiovascular devices most commonly, the primary endpoints were surrogate endpoints. And I'm sure some of you know, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, talk about surrogate endpoints because of the accelerated approval process and the very notable um, approval on the basis of surrogate measures of the new Alzheimer's drug, as you can imagine, which was a surrogate endpoint and an accelerated approval. But we actually found, and this is now uh, 12 years ago since this study was published in JAMA that a lot of device studies going through the 
usual and actually rigorous pre-market approval process, we're also using surrogate endpoints. And what a surrogate endpoint means, just and this is the FDA definition, is a, a laboratory measurement or a physical sign that's used as a substitute or a clinically meaningful endpoint. And so it, it's not an actual clinical endpoint, because a clinical endpoint would measure directly how a patient feels, functions, or survives. But the surrogate endpoint is a marker or a substitute for a clinical endpoint. And so they are appropriate to use if they have been validated. And validated means that they've been shown to predict clinically meaningful endpoints. Because otherwise, essentially, you are treating a, a picture a lab value or something else that is really not meaningful to patients. So surrogate endpoints are useful if they're validated, but a lot of surrogate endpoints used commonly, including in cardiovascular studies, have never been validated. And what I've listed on this slide are just some of the examples that are used of surrogate endpoints that have not been shown um, to predict clinical clinically meaningful endpoints, such as target lesion revascularization for a stent. So we're in a study where essentially you bring everyone in for an angiogram after the stent and show if the artery is open. Well, you know, what's meaningful to patients are, are they going to feel better? Are they going to live longer? Um, or same thing for some EP studies, whether um, the implant successfully went in was considered the endpoint for the study. So, and there's um, a next slide. The reason in particular in that implant is because those are often used in studies that did not have a control group. So if you take a study without randomizing or without a control group, the problem is how do you know whether you can say that this new device um, is working? And so what is done for these devices that did not have a control group in some cases is to use what's called objective performance criteria. And again, I had not been familiar with objective performance criteria until Sanketz and I looked at all these um, SSEDs. And what this means is that the sponsor and the FDA have agreed that the endpoint would be for example, successful, a certain number, 70%, for example, successful implantation of the device. Now, frankly, I mean, all the patients could have died, you know, a week after successful implantation, but you would have still made the objective performance criteria. So clearly there is some assumption beyond that you got it in, that there is a benefit to the device, but it is not required um, when you're using objective performance criteria for these high-risk devices. Another um, alternative to a randomized clinical trial where you, you know, take 100 patients that are you know, pretty similar or, and then split them into two groups and both get one gets the device and one doesn't get the devices or is your control group is to use historical controls. And again, in this case, the sponsor and the FDA agree that they will use the control group from a previous study, and that would be the comparison. And so clearly these are not um, as rigorous or high quality as a randomized clinical trial. Um, so I alluded to the fact uh, that there's also frequently not blinding and difference in standards. So we know that uh, for drugs, it's pretty important to have a placebo control. Well, in devices, I think it's also important to have a placebo control, but it's often not done. And for one thing, placebo control is often referred to as a sham, which in itself has negative connotations. And for the one of the biggest studies uh, that was done in the cardiovascular space that used um, a placebo control, the Orbita study, there was a big discussion over whether to call it a placebo control group or a sham control group. And that was the group that thought they got a stent but did not actually get a stent. And if you go to the next slide, um, this was from Twitter and it's an offline comment. I suggest for those of you who are not on Twitter, you should 
um, start your own Twitter account and follow UCSF Cardiology and um, retweet each other's articles and um, publications because it's really a good way to amplify the work of UCSF in our division. But at any rate, this is a screenshot from someone else's tweet a few years ago when our colleague and uh, cardiologist Rob Califf was FDA commissioner and was asked whether he thought sham controls should be required for device approval. And he said, well, do you want to get the truth or not? Meaning if you want the truth, you need to have a sham control or a placebo control because otherwise you don't know if you're seeing a placebo effect because a lot of people feel better once they've had some kind of procedure or intervention but it may not have anything to do with the intervention. And I think that um, it's a really important point and that we really need to have placebo controls for almost um, all device trials when feasible. Okay, next slide. So the last point I'll make on the high-risk devices is that they are very different than drugs and other devices because due to a Supreme Court ru ruling about 10 years ago, patients do not have um, the right to sue manufacturers. And so the Regal versus Medtronic case was the case of a man who had a faulty stent and I think had a dissection and a tear in his coronary artery because of a faulty stent and attempted to sue the manufacturer but the Supreme, this went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled that because the device had gotten FDA approval, the manufacturer was protected and could not be sued over a product defect in state court. And so it um, was a big victory for manufacturers and not um, so good for patients who had faulty devices because they, have, they do not have standing to sue the manufacturer. Next slide. So now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the 510K clearance, which I mentioned when we started out, because most devices, including still a lots of high-risk devices actually go through a 510K clearance process and not uh, the PMA process that I was just talking about for high-risk devices. So the 510K clearance does not require any clinical data as I said earlier, it's based on substantial equivalence to a prior device, one that's already on the market. And there is no requirement in this pathway to show safety and effectiveness. The only requirement is to show this substantial equivalence. Um, this slide, the next slide please, with the graph of the FDA review process shows if you can, um, see that this is the smallest um, bar, the one in the middle for the original PMA. So again, remember that the original PMA is the only one that requires clinical data. This graph is taken from a review from the General Accounting Office, which is kind of the watchdog agency uh, for federal agencies like FDA, and they looked at approval processes for high-risk devices, and this was back in 2009. And what the GAO found was that for most high-risk devices, we're not going through the original PA PMA pathway, which required clinical data. And in fact, most of them, as you can see, were going through a supplemental process, which sometimes could be appropriate, but sometimes may not be appropriate because it's very hard to know when you're not doing clinical testing, whether a, a small change you may have made in the equipment, the manufacturer, the lead material um, is actually going to improve the device or not improve the device, but the supplement allows you to make that change without any clinical testing beforehand. Um, and as you can see, most of the high-risk devices on the market get on the market through the supplemental PMA pathway. And again, to the left-hand side is the 510K pathway. And you can see that a lot of high-risk devices are actually entering the market um, through the 510K pathway, even though Congress stipulated that all high-risk devices should enter the market through pre-market approval. 
And I think the reason for doing that um, was that it is a lot more work to do a PMA, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the FDA um, does not always have enough resources or staff to do pre-market approval reviews of all high-risk devices. So here's an example, if you go to the next slide, of a 510K device um, that we use fairly commonly in clinical practice, the inferior vena cava filter or IVC filter. It, it is actually classed as a class two device, which also includes devices like a mercury thermometer for taking temperature. It got on the market on the basis of a 510K clearance without any clinical data. And uh, I would say there's still a lot of debate and controversy over, over whether there is any data showing benefit for IVC filters for their intended purpose, which is to prevent um, clots in people that cannot take anticoagulation. First of all, um, from a paper that was published in Archives of Internal Medicine about 11 years ago, only half of all IVC filters are actually implanted for appropriate indications according to our guidelines. Next slide. And I got particularly interested in IVC filters when um, in my sort of first year as uh, editor at what was then Archives of Internal Medicine, we got this paper from a cardiologist at a community hospital in Pennsylvania. So um, this cardiologist, Dr. Nicholson, got interested in IVC filters because he had a patient who came to him with a chest pain and shortness of breath and on imaging, he discovered that she had a cardiac um, perforation due to an IVC filter that had been placed that had fractured and then embolized and punctured her pericardium and into her heart. And so that led him on his own, which I thought was quite amazing, to study all of the patients at his hospital that had gotten similar filters. And he looked at the barred recovery and G2 filters and through imaging and clinical follow-up found that 25% of those filters, um, the barred recovery had fractured and embolized and 12% of the G2 filters had fractured and embolized and leading in some cases to cardiac tamponade and perforation. I will note that these are um, cleared as retrievable filters, meaning they were only supposed to be placed for a short time period during which somebody was at high risk for embolization or for clotting. And then they were supposed to be removed. However, um, data shows that only about 7% or less of retrievable filters are actually retrieved. And that is likely a lot of the problems because the longer these filters are in, the higher chance there is of fracture and embolizations. I think because they really weren't made for staying in the bloodstream and all the shear forces of being in the inferior vena cava for years and years. And in fact, the biggest difference between the barred recovery and the G2 filters seemed to be that the G2 were newer filters. And so they had been implanted for less years, but that if you um, normalize by year, the fracture and embolization rates were very similar. And so again, the lesson being the longer they're in, the more likely they are to fracture and embolize and they should certainly be number one used appropriately if there is appropriate, because as I said, data of clinical benefit is still pretty weak. And, but if they are used to be retrieved as intended. Next slide. So the same week that the Archives of Internal Medicine published the study, the FDA issued a warning on uh, inferior vena cava filters. And the FDA warning basically said that they had 921 reports of adverse events related to the devices. And the part of the warning was reminding doctors that we should be removing these devices. And um, I will say, um, parenthetically, I was at a... FDA town hall meeting a few weeks after this FDA warning was issued. And there was an attendee from the post-market surveillance branch of FDA. And I asked him, you know, what prompted them 
to issue this warning, you know, 921 adverse events seemed like a lot to me. And I wondered if there was any particular number or trigger for issuing a safety warning. And as I said, I mean, I don't think it was coincidence that this warning was issued the same right after the publication of the article in Archives of Internal Medicine detailing the problems with inferior vena cava filters. But what the FDA official told me was basically they had never looked at the adverse event reporting before um, the attention from that paper. And so because there isn't a routine process for reviewing adverse events um, reported to the FDA, and as I said, they are understaffed and under-resourced, certainly in um, rec recording adverse events. And I will come back to that a little bit later. Okay, next slide. Um, and so this was, again, uh, from a editorial that Sanket and I wrote in Archives of Internal Medicine to accompany a paper which looked at uh, recalls of medical devices. And that the paper was from uh, Steve Nissen and Diana Zuckerman. And what they found was basically that most of the high risk recalls or the ones that are considered to be life threatening are not for high risk devices, but they're for devices that went through usually the 510K process. And so it suggests that these 510K devices, for example, like an IVC filter should really have been classified as um, high risk and gone through a pre-market approval process with clinical data. And certainly one can't predict all the things that could happen in bigger studies and longer follow-up, but certainly having some clinical data at least showing benefit and doing a more rigorous assessment of, of benefits and harms would be helpful for these high-risk implanted devices. Um, and again, in the study of looking at misclassification of high-risk devices um, based on their risk for recalls, the most common category was cardiovascular devices, which is not a surprise because obviously a lot of these uh, devices are going to be implanted in, in sick patients and thus high risk. Um, I'll just spend a few minutes, I think, talking about gender bias and then wrap up with um, some improvements I think that could be made in FDA medical device regulation. Um, so as Joyce mentioned, I have always been very interested in uh, women and heart disease, and in particular these days, why women are underrepresented in clinical trials. And that is certainly true for um, cardiovascular devices. This was from uh, another study that um, Sanket, Lisa Barrow, and I did about 10 years ago, where we looked um, at whether or not the FDA had um, had a sex-specific analysis for cardiovascular devices, and on the basis of that had what they call a gender bias statement. So the FDA says that um, they expect to have as many women as have the disease, and we know that women are about half of our population with heart disease, so that would mean about half the population should be women. When we looked at the um, data for cardiovascular devices, we found that the average was 33% female, and that actually the number of uh, women and men was only reported in 72% of studies, and in the rest, it was not stated. Next slide. Um, and we also found that 41% of the studies, or less than half, actually had an analysis to address whether there was gender bias meaning did the device work equally in men and in women? And because we know that women are different than men in many ways, including that they tend to have more bleeding and more procedural complications, it is especially important to include women in clinical device trials and to do sex-specific analysis. Um, and that was highlighted by our finding that in studies that do look at gender bias, 25% found a difference in safety and effectiveness by sex. And we um, disappointingly found no increase over time in the enrollments of women 
And having looked at this data again more recently, and um, perhaps we'll do again with um, Jesse Holtzman, one of our residents, there has still not been an increase in the number of women in cardiovascular um, device trials. Next slide. And then actually next slide again, I'm gonna try to skip through some of this to make up some time. So I'll just spend a moment I think now on post-approval because we think, okay, if we're not getting all the device pre-market, sometimes we can get data post-market and we know we can, you know, through registries. I think cardiology has the most ro robust registry um, system with National Cardiovascular Device Registry, TVT and others. Um, this was from a study published in JAMA from Harlan Krumholtz's group, where they looked at pre-market and post-market studies. They found a um, high percentage of, well, all pre-market studies are industry funded, which is um, common. And 40% of post-market studies were industry funded and two thirds were open label. Um, next slide. However, the issues with the post-market studies are more to do, in my opinion, with the fact that often they're not done. And this was from a study that um, I did with some colleagues at uh, Pew in a group based in Washington about 10 years ago. And actually, um, Danny Hidano, who just finished her residency at UCSF and is now a fellow at, in uh, cardiology at UW, and Sanket and I just updated this study and those results will hopefully be published in the next year. Um, but at any, the findings have not changed. Sadly, the post-approval studies that are um, required by the FDA are often small sample size, um, very slow, or actually don't get completed for all kinds of reasons. And when they do get completed, they take an average of three years. And so it's relevant because if you're approving a study and trying to get things on the market more quickly, which has been the trend for FDA, oftentimes what's said is, well, we'll get more data post-approval. But what we found is that it's very slow and sometimes doesn't happen at all to actually get these post-approval studies done. And on the... Um, of course, then the other important question is, OK, what do we do with the information from the post-approval studies? And so on the next slide, I'm, this is a summary of all of the times that post-marketing studies led to withdrawal of devices due to problems in the post-marketing study. OK, um, next slide. I think uh, this is a slide um, to show some recent work. This was done again from another one of our residents, Christina Lilani, um, who is currently a resident of applying in cardiology. Um, Madris um, Kennard, who runs the device events, um, Sanket and I. And in this study, we and Christina and Ellie did most of this work looked at all MAUD reports for patient death. And what we were particularly looking for was how often reports that are filed to MAUD, and MAUD is the um, FDA adverse event reporting database. And what the FDA says on its website is if you have an adverse event for a patient with a device and a death occurs, but you are not sure if the death is related to the device or not, it should be reported as a death, and there is no assumption that the device caused a death, but it does trigger the FDA to look at those um, adverse event reports. And this is relevant because as I mentioned to you a number of years ago, that post-marketing surveillance um, head from the FDA told me that they don't routinely re review the other reports, for example, the injuries or malfunctions, and that was why they hadn't noticed the big signal in IVC filter adverse event reports until the uh, publication of that Archives of Internal Medicine article. But the FDA is required to routinely re re review reports of deaths that are occur in patients with devices. 
Now, first of all, most people, I'm sorry to say, including myself, are don't report adverse events to the FDA. The only um, groups that are required to report are the manufacturers and institutions. Physicians are not required to report to the FDA, and it's not that easy to do it, and for a number of reasons. It's estimated that only 10 to 15 percent of all adverse events um, in devices actually get reported. So already we know it's underestimated, but what we looked at in this study was how often reports of death occurred in categories other than death. And what we found was about 18% uh, of this random sample, and then we used NLP to look a little deeper, were reported in other categories. So that means that it's likely that there are a lot more deaths um, that are not being reported as deaths, but being reported in the category of malfunction or injury and thus not examined um, by the FDA. And so we're again, losing a lot of opportunity to better inform patient care. Okay, Joyce, I think I'm gonna skip the next, so skip the all the HDE slides because of the, and just go to the one that says the FDA's medical device problem. So this, I'm gonna, <laughs> start to wrap up and sort of say what we think would improve things and make things better um, for patients and for all of us. So this was an op-ed that uh, Sanket and I wrote for the New York Times six years ago. And we wrote it because the 21st Century Cures Act was being discussed in the Congress. I will note that um, the 21st Century Cures Act did pass in December of 2016, despite our op-ed, but what we said was that regulatory oversight has not kept pace with the increasing um, complexity of medical device technology and that the Cures Act, which as I said, did pass, was actually lowering the evidentiary bar for the FDA. And so the Cures Act now allows companies to submit anecdotal or case reports or expert opinion instead of randomized clinical trials. It moved a great deal in shifting the burden of evidence to post-marketing because the idea was to get potentially life-saving um, devices onto the market more quickly. And that therefore, because you were shortening pre-market to do more in the post-market. But what it actually means because of what I've been talking to you about for the last uh, 45 minutes is that it's potentially subjecting millions of Americans to unsafe or untested medical devices because our pre-market process is not sufficient to establish safety and effectiveness. And the post-marketing studies often don't happen. And when they do, do not change practice. Um, I will note also that IO, the IOM 10 years ago did an entire review of the 510k process and concluded that the 510k process should be abandoned because there was no way to assure safety and effectiveness of any 510k device because there's no requirement for safety and effectiveness in that pathway. Next slide, and then next slide to what needs to be done. Okay, so what can we do? So I just, next slide, to, review. The purpose of regulation is to both ensure the safety and effectiveness and to balance that with getting potentially life-saving devices on the market quickly and to patients. Next slide. So I've talked about some of the limitations, I think, to our current process and ways I want to talk now about ways I think it could be improved. I think we should um, be more rigorous, and I'm talking now about high-risk devices and not just cardiovascular, but all high-risk devices. Um, the trials should be mostly randomized control trials. And I think ideally there should be two trials to be more consistent and confident in our conclusions. I think the study patients should reflect the population with the disease being treated, meaning it, they should be much more diverse. We, there is a tendency to have a lot of exclusions. Um, so patients are much younger, healthier, generally more white and more male than our populations that we see in clinical practice. And I don't think that 
that is a good way to make conclusions and it makes it difficult to extrapolate and generalize to all populations. I think there has to be greater and timely public access to data. A lot of the data that's submitted to FDA is considered secret and proprietary. And the same is true for the post-market data. And there needs to be much greater transparency. And also that um, there has to be greater authority for the FDA to remove unsafe and ineffective devices from the market when necessary. Next slide. So again, I think there needs to be robust trial design. Um, some of the things I've talked about earlier are the, um, I think there should be clinically meaningful endpoints and avoid surrogate outcomes unless they're uh, well validated and there is an urgency for approval. I think it's important to have randomized and concurrent controls, not historical controls, which are not reliable. Um, to look at clinically meaningful endpoints, not, not statistically meaningful. And I think it's better to require superiority and not non-inferiority trials. Um, next slide. Uh, so again, I think we need high quality data, better post-marketing data, and more transparency, both pre and post approval. Uh, next slide. And I think I've covered some of these. Um, the trials should include gender and ethnic diversity, and the design should depend on the expected benefits and risks. You know, how urgent is the approval? Do we have alternatives already for treatment of the disease? Um, so I hope I've given you some things to think about. Next slide. I do want to thank I, the, my um, team and collaborators on all of this work. It's really a, a great pleasure to um, work with everyone. Um, a number of, besides Sanket, a number of, uh, we have a collaboration in Louisiana um, and a number of our trainees and students have worked with us. Um, next slide. So thanks very much uh, for your attention and uh, letting me talk about medical devices and I'm happy um, to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Redberg. That was a great presentation. Okay. Um, I wanna give uh, people an option to ask questions and it looks like we have one. Uh, Dr. Sang, I'm gonna allow you to speak. Uh, we'll be able to see, I believe, and hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Rita, uh, thanks for your work and advocacy in this field. I think it's uh, well needed. Um, as you know, and you pointed out before, the most important device problems are the ones that cause death. And those are systematically missed in the, uh, both the pre and post market approval uh, process. And <clears throat> um, as you know, we, we found uh, device problems post mortem orders of magnitude higher than uh, than device companies have published and I've tried to um, partner with the FDA to continue that work and expand that work but been uh, hit, hit hit some some barriers in there and, and I don't know if they're political or what I'm curious of, of your thoughts Zian thanks for that question and <laughs> I think you know your paper and your work and I love for you to talk more about that really opened my eyes to other issues and i'll just say and as you is referring to you know he leads a national study now on autopsies and sudden cardiac death but i would in my summary of some of um, your work was that some people that have died with implantable electronic devices pacemakers and defibrillators actually died due to malfunctions in those devices that were not suspected um, except that um, you you learn that on autopsy and uh, your examination, and I will say that I mean sadly, frankly, when Sanket and I did that study, you know that I showed you from two thousand nine, published in JAMA, mm -hmm. I was on the cardiovascular device expert panel, and I had access to all of the proprietary data, um, and I reviewed that all, and I wanted to make a reference in the paper that said the review of the proprietary data did not change our findings because it did not you know because what's published on the summaries of safety and effectiveness which we reviewed are is what's publicly available i um talked 
to the cardiovascular device, the head of the expert panel and said, I just wanna put this line in saying, review of the proprietary data did not change our findings because it wasn't revealing anything. It was just stating that. And he looked at me and said, I would never do anything to upset our industry sponsors. And I think that unfortunately explains a lot of the behavior of the FDA. I, it's not in, I've heard that many other people and colleagues have told me they've had the same kind of feeling from FDA that um, pr probably for many reasons, one of which perhaps is the medical device user fee act. So the device industry does contribute some user fees and in return for those contributions, uh, they are very specific that the criteria they are basing their contributions on is that devices have to be approved quickly. So all of that money goes to approving devices quickly. And when the FDA talks about its success, their success is always how many devices did they approve? It's not how many beneficial devices did they approve? How many safe and effective devices did they approve? It's how many. And that could include dangerous devices. And unfortunately, I mean, I think the FDA needs to keep sight of its mission that it is to protect the public health and not um, to get potentially dangerous devices on the market quickly. But I'm interested, Zian, if you have other thoughts and if you've worked in the area too. Absolutely, and I <clears throat> echo what you're saying, which is I think there's um, conflict of interest and um, you know other in undue influences, both in the FDA and also editorial boards. Um, notably, I sent that paper to Circulation Jack and it, it was hard to imagine some of the comments not coming from conflicted reviewers with a lot of ties to industry. Um, and we had a very nice, um, you know, uh, op, um, uh, positive response from reviewers, um, you know, at, at your journal. And so we were, I was surprised. I thought that made me think, well, why, how, how was there so much pushback at the other journals? And um, I think we, we had a nerve with some of these and at the FDA as well. Um, I'll make two points, which is <clears throat> um, these are the most on the device I, on the, in the cardiac implantable device side. These are the most um, highest priority problems to solve because we put those in to prevent sudden death and sudden death occurred despite that device being in that person. Right. So those have to be picked uh, found. And so we found, you know, hardware problems, device fracture, um, rapid battery depletion. We also found physician uh, factors such as programming errors or programming algorithms. Uh, I'll give you a good example, which is, you know, there's been a, a movement in our field to program devices with very prolonged detection intervals because we want to avoid inappropriate shocks for early shocks. And that has a cost, which is to uh, miss some events that, that are longer because they start to degrade and the VF starts to be undersensed and the device thinks it's returned to sinus. And the vast majority of our uh, devices with ICDs were programmed in that manner. So some of our, our programming is, um, you know, not illuminated by these lessons that we might learn looking post-mortem. The other, the other and very important point is, um, you know, device companies with all these recalls you hear um, are pouring money into uh, problems that aren't necessarily the most serious problems, right? Because these patients have lived. Um, the device fractures and the battery um, uh, failures that we saw were not recalled devices, you know? So, so in other words, we're seeing the inverse of the, of the serious problems because they survived. Um, and, 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 and we're putting resources into problems that are not the most lethal problems. Um, I think the, those are great points, Ian. And I think, like I said, your work has been really illuminating and it is, um, of great concern and the you know sort of the delays in adverse event reporting the fact that it's up to the manufacturer I mean it's a little like the fox guarding the hen house because the other thing we don't know is how many things get reported to the manufacturer that never get reported to the FDA you know there have been for example the bleeding edge the um, documentary the Netflix documentary which I highly recommend uh, which uh, talked about the problems in medical device uh, reporting. Uh, 
documented that for Eshor, which they, they really looked at a, a women's a contraception device, there were thou tens of thousands of adverse event reports to the manufacturer that did not get to the FDA because these women got together on Facebook and in listservs and discovered that. Um, I just want, I think Sanket is in the audience and he's been um, such an amazing collaborator in this work. I don't know, Sanket, if you wanna make any comments. Uh, yeah, thanks so much. I think this is a great discussion. I think that ultimately, at the end of the day, we want devices that are going to help our patients. And I think we all benefit from a strong regulatory infrastructure where the standards are one that we have guaranteed evidence of clinical benefit. Um, and we avoid lots of potentially risky uh, devices coming to market. And we also benefit at the end of the day from knowing that we're improving clinical outcomes that matter to patients. And it just seems like there's, I feel like uh, what Rita's presented this afternoon has been great, but in some ways also the tip of the iceberg. And, and I think we just have a lot more work to do and, and everyone benefits. Thanks, Sanke. And I don't, Ralph put a comment in, do I have time, Joyce, or should we take it offline? Yeah, I was gonna ask actually, if Dr. Brindis wanted to speak, I can, um, I can let you ask your question out, out loud. Let me just... For some reason, I'm not finding him in the participants. But I guess if you can comment. Sure, I'll just summarize briefly. I think, and Ralph has you know, been a leader in the National Cardiovascular Device Registry and on the FDA device panel. He's noting that um, there's registries are taking an increasing role in post-approval studies, which I certainly agree with and, and think is great. Um, as we have discussed, my issue with the registries is that they add to, to add to RCT data, but I don't think they can replace it because you don't have the control group. So we find out what happens if you get the device, but we don't find out what happens if you didn't get the device. And so the first question is, are you better off having gotten the device? Then the registries are great. Um, the other thing is that the NCDR is not publicly available and is not transparent. And so it's not, you know, I am not able to access the data. It's, you know, there's a process and it doesn't allow most people to access that data. I don't know if Ralph has other comments because I can only read the first part of his while talking. Yeah, um, yeah thanks. Thanks, Rita. The, the data, it, the raw data itself uh, may not be obtainable by uh, external people, but certainly any questions and uh, analytical work that wants to be done that you submit, of course, Rita, as you know, uh, can be looked at. You made another comment related to 510K devices, um, implying that no clinical data is uh, uh, submitted. And I may push back a little bit on that. I said not required. Sorry, it, not can, required. It, it, is, it can be submitted, and I think it's 5 to 10% of submissions, but it's not, you know, it's not a requirement that FDA can ask for it. Yeah, I guess that's particularly true with predicate devices. But uh, as you know, you and uh, Sandit uh, submitted a comment letter on a panel I just participated in on a 510K device. That is the embolic protection device for TAVR. And, uh, you know, it was an interesting uh, discussion because that, that um, it fits right into your, dis uh, your whole comments. Here is a company that was, had had two randomized clinical trials that were more or less negative, if not trending towards harm. And they decided they wanted to be viewed as a predicate device as a 510K against a, uh, a previous device, the Sentinel device, which was approved without, which it did not really show endpoint efficacy. And uh, uh, your comment letter was spot on. And as you know, the, the CV device uh, panel group also uh, showed a lot of concern about this particular device and adv advised against its approval. Um, thanks for that update and thanks for your work on the device panel, Ralph. We're really delighted that, that you're there and so aware of the importance of randomized trial data and be interested to see the FDA decision on that one. Agree. Um, I think there was one more question, but we are out of time. I do think it's a really interesting comment though that I have experienced um, when talking to you know, laymen or patients about 
what we can do um, to improve the public trust after we've experienced multiple issues with um, conspiracy theories, especially during the COVID pandemic um, with the FDA. Um, and that was by our uh, congenital uh, fellow Khaled. Um, I don't know if you have a, a brief comment before we end our session today. No, and I mean, that's it really, it is consistent with why it's so important to have trust in the FDA, because obviously we have this huge public health crisis, and yet there are people that are now, you know, not taking COVID vaccine because they say they don't trust the FDA, and it's very sad. Um, it, it's very sad, and I think, you know, it's really important that the agency keep its mission in mind and that the public trusts the agency. Um, in order to protect the public health. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I think this is great conversation. Um, and we'll see you next week for our next cardiology grand rounds. Thank you, Dr. Redberg. Thank you, Joyce. And I said, call me Rita. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. Yeah, he's sunken. <laughs>